Guitar Arrangers podcast, the greatest guitar arrangers podcast in the history of the universe. Welcome back. All right. We have yeah. been on a on a little bit of a summer break, but we were getting up <laughs> to some uh, some pretty cool things, I believe. Uh, Thomas, what were you up to this summer? Yeah, I went to the uh, Celedonio Romero Guitar Institute this uh, this summer, and it was it was it was it was really cool. It was really, where, really where's cool. that at? It's a it's in Oklahoma City. Uh, I don't know if that's where where it's going to happen next year, but they always update the website. But normally, it happens in Oklahoma City, and um, they even gave me a skateboard. They gave me a, a, a official Romero skateboard while I was there. It was crazy. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool. It's made by uh, Pepe Romero's son, I believe, who's a luthier in California. Yeah, the Romeros, you know, I mean, they're just like the most legendary, some of the most legendary guitarists alive. You know, they're uh, going and studying with, you know, the Romeros. It's like for guitar, it's like going and studying with Itzhak Perlman for for violin or Arthur Rubenstein on piano. You know, you just can't beat it. But anyways, I was driving there and I got a call from the guy who runs the Institute, my old teacher, Matt Denman. And, you know, he was like, hey, what if you did an interview with Pepe, you know, while you were here? Because he's got a bunch of arrangements. And I was like, well, my mind was blown. You know, I it's like uh, it's the it's the dream interview. It's the dream interview. But I had none of my equipment. Because I was already driving there, so I didn't get to bring this this fancy mic or anything uh, or any cool camera. So I just had my phone and uh, note notepad. So I had to ask him for the interview because it was just like kind of an idea that was up in the air. It wasn't like uh, you know he had talked to Pepe in advance and it, it had all been scheduled. So I had to put in a lot of elbow grease to make it happen. And uh, you know, I was pestering them for the interview for a while. And then um, I had to really study up on this stuff because uh, I don't know if, how familiar you are with Pepe Romero's discography, but it's I like think, I think even an Pepe, encyclopedia. <laughs> I think even Pepe, like in the interview, I remember listening to it and he was like, wow, you really did a lot of research. Like you, you really, you really came at him with all of the, all of the arrangements that he's done before you dug up a lot from the past <laughs> that was cool so i had to well i had to study up and figure out which ones were arrangements and which ones were not because it's, it's not like you can go through his discography and then sort it by arrangements um and we're talking i mean i filled up two pages just with the names of composers that had been arranged and then there are also things that that he has arranged that are not available on the discography. Uh, there are things that are co-arranged by him and one of his family members, because you know the, the royal family of guitar and all that. So it, it's a little, it was a little complicated, but I hope you guys will enjoy listening to our um, uh, very MacGyver together uh, interview with uh, Pepe Rivero. Tony's cleaned up the audio uh, as much as we can. It's got a bit of rustling and stuff, but some of the stuff that Pepe Romero talks about is like, he's never talked about some of this stuff ever. So it's such a cool interview. So, so that's true. Yeah. I mean, enjoy. I've, I've listened to the other um, Pepe Romero interviews that are out there and um, I thought, yeah, he was kind of even taken aback because we really were um, coming at him with questions from a topic that people don't really ask about. Um so I feel like uh, if you've heard other Pepe Romero interviews before, this one will definitely be different. So you'll hear some some new takes from from the maestro. Um, anyway, should we just get right into it? All right. Without yeah, further absolutely. ado, uh, here it is. Jump cut. Well, I, again, yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time out of this crazy institute, and we're all we're all running around scrambled. It's and nonstop. <laughs> I hit, come here in the morning. Ah, go crazy. Yeah, it's fun though. It's really it is, fun. It is great. Yeah, it's it's great. It's great to be here again and see yeah. you again and everybody and how yeah. everybody has changed so much um, after the pandemic. Yes. 
it's it's absolutely incredible. But uh, and I want to talk to you more about the institute. But we only have a small amount of time to talk. And um, okay, uh, talk to me about anything you want. Three three whole pages of uh, your arrangements here. Okay. <laughs> Well, so for the first thing is when I was going through your arrangements, you know, uh, it's really hard to get a good idea of how much you've done because you have, you know, many arrangements of even the same song sometimes, like it's some two of the, times, yeah. I mean, how many different arrangements of, uh, say, uh, the Malaganya, famous Malaganya, do you have? I don't know. A few. <laughs> a few. Yeah, a few. <laughs> a few. The last one was done during COVID yeah. when uh, Mark Girge and Uro um, Barish started this virtual guitar orchestra. Yeah. I don't know if you heard about it. Uh, yeah, I was um, one of the players in the Malaganya Day In mine, yes, I saw it. Yeah, yeah it was uh, fun. So that was the last version of the Malaganyas that included a, a song with mm. my grandson. Did you watch the end product of it? Yes. Yeah, your, your, yeah. Your, is it your son or your grandson? My grandson. My yeah, grandson. your grandson. Yeah, he does a great job. He's an opera singer, a tenor, uh, currently in, in Germany. Mm. But so, yes, I have done many of Rumores de la Caleta. I did one in D minor, one in A minor. Mm. And one for two guitars. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so specifically about the Malaganya de Jotron. 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 That one kind of uh, borders on composition as yes. well. Yes. Yes. That is more of a composition <laughs> based on the Malaganyas. Yeah. And I guess that gets me into my first like big question, which is... You know, what do you think is the difference between the composition and the arrangement? You know, where does one begin? Where does one end? Or are they all interwoven? Are there any specific? They can be. They can be interwoven. There's a lot of, I would say, composition. You bring your own composition's ability to do an arrangement. Mm. I've done many arrangements. I've also done many transcriptions. I consider a transcription when it's more literal mm -hmm. and you just take it from one instrument to the other and the gift that you bring to the piece is mainly the the sonority of the guitar mm. um, but sometimes in, a, in arranging you keep it's the same piece but you make your you do you take more liberties with it yeah, are there any techniques that, um, do you ever add, uh, for example, a bass note to a violin melody or something when you're doing a transcription? Yes, yes. I, sometimes, sometimes I do. Mm. It depends on the period. Mm. Okay. It, for me, it depends on the period. I have done, uh, oh. well, speaking of violin, I did several things. I did the, the Bach partitas and particularly the D minor and there I was very very sparse with the basses that I added. I didn't add any I asked bass at sometimes just for the support of the sonority but not as an added uh, line. Many people have the, the take those that same piece and do a lot of their own um, adding lines. I like very much the purity of it, but I love the sonority that the guitar brings to it. Yes. So more of the what I did to that is take it from the from the original violin music and then put it into the guitar and with the guitar you can have a lot of time. I played with the actual harmonic structure that Bach puts within one line. Mm. And by letting some notes ring up underneath another, 
you create this uh, harmonic that is in the piece itself. But that the guitar has the ability to, to hold some notes while you play some other yeah. And they're ringing through and forming this harmonic structure mm. that is inside the piece. Via their sympathetic resonance. That's right, that's right. So I played a lot with that. Uh, from the violin, I've also done some Mozart rond two Mozart rondos that I recorded with the Academy of St. Martin in the field. And there, again, is more the sonority. I didn't change very much at all. So those are much more a transcription mm. than... And now I have a, a bed with a, a very dear friend of mine that before he turns 85, and he will turn 85 in in a year and a half, I will play for him the Beethoven Violin Concerto. Mm. <laughs> so it's a project. I'm just beginning that project. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you'll have to, you know, let me take a sneak peek at your score when you're done with it. That would be so cool. Yes, and that, <laughs> I'm going to take the music and what I, my idea, in my mind I have already done it. Mm -hmm. I have to write it out. And what that one will be is, I imagine that the Beethoven Violin Concerto is written by Mauro Giuliani. And I will do a lot of the techniques, a lot of the way that Giuliani would have written that piece. Wow. Yeah, that would be really cool. That would really be really cool to add in there. So I have a couple of different names. I thought it was really interesting when I was looking through your discography that you have many arrangements that you've chosen to credit your uh, father, Celedonio, for doing rather than trying to do your own version. And um, why is it important to you um, to uh, spread the legacy of Celedonio? I, mean, I, I kind of already know, but, but you you, tell you do it because the, his legacy was magnificent. He taught me a lot about arranging, mm -hmm. and all the arrangements that I claim are his were really his. Yes, of course. They he really did them, and he was a magnificent arranger mm -hmm. and transcriber, and his the like the things that he did with Torre Bermeja, with the, the tango of Albeniz, the Granada, Sevilla, they were the, the, all the Albeniz, the Granados, the, the dances of Granados, his, his um, concept of putting those pieces for the guitar was extraordinary and very, very much set the direction and the goals and the beacon that I would follow. Yeah, that's, that's it's, it's always really um, one of the more beautiful things of coming to the Romero Institute, listening to you talk about the legacy of love and family and togetherness and the guitar. Yeah, the guitar. and the connection. This institute is all about taking the past, looking to the future and connecting it and bringing it to now, hmm. to here, and, and feel that incredible, great feeling that is to, do, to have something you love and that you've seen it given to you by your elders and then you pass it on to the future generation and see young people like yourself who are uh, <laughs> magnificent players and doing extraordinary projects and it's a fabulous thing for me. Well, you're, you're too kind to me, but the, the pleasure is, is all uh, on us students Thank here you. at the Institute. Um, 
I was going to ask if you had any other favorite guitar arrangers or any other favorite guitar arrangements. Oh, yeah, of course. A lot of them. <laughs> um, for example, my colleague and friend and also a long time disciple of mine, Vicente Cobes, mm, does yeah. magnificent arrangements. He's coming up with a recording of um, movie music. That's nice. And his arrangement of that is is extraordinary. Of course, you. Uh. You and, and your work on the planets. That is a major contribution to the guitar literature. And it's a, it's a major uh, project. Mm. Uh, Lorenzo Palomo, the wonderful composer, has taken a lot of time to arrange pieces by, uh, of sarsuelas and uh, Spanish things and, and sonatas from uh, Antonio Soler, Domenico Scarlatti. And uh, there are many, many great, great arrangers. And, uh, and uh, I love, because I've spent a lot of my time in my life to reviving old works, mm -hmm. having world premieres, works written that I have mm, brought them, have been kind of like the obstetrician of the, the guy that delivers the baby. <laughs> and uh, I have, I have uh, done many world premieres. But transcribing has been an incredible, incredible uh, love of mine. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a really amazing feeling when you you know you have this piece transcribed and it's like you you know you, I'm sure there are many pieces for you that for a time like you were the only person who could play many of these pieces. And yes, it's a great yes. feeling. Yes, it's a it's a fantastic <laughs> it's a fantastic feeling because when you have a piece of music that you love and then you you think what could, would the what how would it sound if he had written it for the guitar? Mm. And that wake up the desire to make the transcription or the arrangement. And then you do it and you hear it and of course, it's the same piece, but it got a completely different uh, way. Mm -hmm. Well, I would have probably have to arrange the planets 50 times to, you know, keep up with the uh, amount, sheer amount of uh, arrangements that you have here. I mean, we're talking stuff from Defia, Granados, Targa, Madura, uh, Munara, Rafael, Milan, Guaran, Jimenez. Uh, Vignes. Uh, Vignes. Vignes. That was a cool. That. The Minuet Spectral. Uh, the Minuet Spectral is a magnificent piece. Mm. And I did. I was asked by the Festival of Schleswig Holstein to play a concert during the Ravel year to play a tribute to Ravel. And I thought. But. What can I play? The Pavan for uh, Una Funta di Fanta. And then I thought, but Ravel was in love with Spain. Mm. And he very often had big parties of musicians where all the musicians around him at that time were Spanish. It was Turina, it was Falla, it, it was... Um, and I thought, he had one person that is a Spaniard, a Spaniard but um, Ricardo Vignes had never written for the guitar. And I thought, what piece would be good? Well, the one that he dedicated to Ravel, mm. the Minuet Espectra. He wrote it for Ravel, 
as a tribute when Ravel was alive, but then he never gave it to him because he thought it sounded too sad. <laughs> the piece that he wrote sounded sad, and then when Ravel died, he premiered it. Oh, it's a turn of events. A turn of events. <laughs> and, I, and it sounds wonderful on the guitar. Mm. It sounds fantastic. It's, that's one of my... That wasn't so long ago. That was about five years. When was the Ravel year? It was about five years ago. It must have been. It's available on your website, pepperino.com. Yes. yes. And, and uh, I enjoyed that piece a lot. But I have enjoyed every single... You can ask me about any... No, I was going to ask if you got any, if you got like a favorite, like top three arrangements you've done, top five. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't <laughs> have favorites, but the people, we some of our biggest hits mm -hmm. have been some of the early arrangements that I did when the quartet, uh, our quartet, my family and I started concertizing, and uh, we needed repertoire because there was no nothing for, for guitars. So I started pumping them out like I was cooking <laughs> hotcakes. And I made some of my the ones that have endured the test of time and people love it, like the Jota of La Dolores. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the ones that when I do an arrangement, it's because I'm very in love and excited about a piece of music. And I just can't wait to have that piece of music come out of my hands. Mm. And you yes. know the feeling. Yes, yes, I know what you're talking about. You know the feeling. So <laughs> that particular, I love one of my favorite operas, and I am a, a big lover of opera. And one of my favorite operas is La Dolores by Thomas Breton. Mm -hmm. It's a very tragic, very deep, profound opera that the last act revolves around this one piece that keeps coming in different versions through the opera. And that's the Jota, which is a very happy Piece. So I transcribed it, and that has been one of the favorite. The, the Miller's Dance from the Three Corner Ballet by Hard Ballet by Manuel de Falla. The first dance of La Vida Breve have also been favorites of the of the public. El Baile de Luis Alonso, uh, the Carmen Suite, which I did in collaboration. That's also fun when you mm -hmm. have two friends and you collaborate with them doing an arrangement. I did it with the son of Federico Moreno Torroba. His name is also Federico Moreno Torroba. And we did an arrangement of uh, uh, Carmen, songs from Carmen, from the opera. And uh, that, that, was, that was great. Way, way, way back, way back, I'm going to tell you about an arrangement that the day I slow down, I'll start uh, doing, I'll, I'll get it published. Oh. And my brother Angel and I, we did a, an arrangement together. He did one variation and I did another variation. Oh, that's cool. And that's cool. the variation that I transcribed, I played first guitar and he played second. The next variation, he transcribed it, he played first guitar, and I played second, and we switched. And we performed it in, in the Philharmonic Hall in New York. We performed in, town, in Carnegie Hall, and we did quite a few performances, and then we stopped playing it because it's such a long piece, the Goldberg Variations. What? You have, you have a duo arrangement of the Goldberg Variations. I do. Wow. And I told you because I know you don't what? have it there. No, yeah, I did not find that. And that's yeah. one of my favorites. But yeah. I only have yeah. half. <laughs> and Angel has the other half. 
Wow. Angel is also cool. a great, Angel is a magnificent arranger. Mm hmm. That's a, that's a crazy story. That's awesome. Are there any other uh, secret arrangements that I've uh, missed? <laughs> well, yes, you would like. You. Um, when, when I. At the beginning, when I met you, you were playing Chopin. Yeah. Yeah, I used to play some of that. I had an idea did some Chopin. Mm. Okay. Some of his waltzes and some, some of his preludes. Yeah, well, you guys, uh, your uh, romantic style of playing you know, very well suits the, yeah. the Chopin style. As you, far know, as you know what? My, one of my all time favorite arrangers, Francisco Tarrega. Right. Uh, Let's not whom, forget him. To, to whom you have a historical lineage. Of course. Traced through uh, Daniel Fortea. Yes, of course. And some of his other students as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's. Uh, do you feel like that's a, a big weight on your shoulders? No. You know? It's <laughs> a great gift <laughs> on my soul. Man, this, this is amazing. Um, well, so um, for all this Albanese repertoire, you play pretty much exclusively either your own arrangements or Celedonio Romero's arrangements. Yes. But there's one that stuck out that you play, um, and I looked up the name of the arranger and I couldn't find anything on it. Are you talking uh, about Mallorca by Mark Switzer? Yeah, Mallorca. Yeah, he's a student of mine, a wonderful guitarist. Really? Yeah, he lives in, he lives in Tampa, Florida. Okay. And he made a magnificent arrangement of of Mallorca, so yeah, he made the arrangement and I finger did the fingerings. Mm. Well, it's a great compliment to him that you know. Thank you. I mean, this is this is. You've done quite a bit of homework. <laughs> uh, I do have another name too that I want to ask you about. I want to ask you about um, who is Eduardo Catamario and what's your relationship with with him? Uh, he's arranged. Uh, some of the music that you've played or made versions like the Madara Fantasia, perhaps, and the Capriccio Arabe? No, the Capriccio Arabe that I play mm -hmm. is based, uh, um, I don't know why his name came, the Capriccio Arabe is based on what my father and the student of Tarrega, Rogelio Molina. Mm. Okay. Used to tell us of how Tarrega played it, like the some of the slurs being taken out, some slurs put in in a different spot. No, not slur, glissandos. Oh, yeah. Glissandos, the opening, descending passage that he repeats it in the same off octave. Later in his life, he made it an octave lower. Hmm. Later in Targa's life? In Targa's yeah. life. After it was published, he used to play it an octave lower. That's really cool to know. Okay, let's see. Uh, next one. Uh, could you tell us the story of, uh, you know, the music that you did as a collaboration with the singer and what happened to it and all that? I met... At the time, he wasn't very much known, and I was asked by my manager if I wanted to do a tour in collaboration with the bass baritone. And I loved singing, so I always excited. I wanted to hear and meet him. And he turned out to, he was talking about Thomas Kwastov, one of the greatest singers of our times. Mm. And uh, so we met, I remember, in, it was in the same street in Salzburg where Mozart was born. And we met in a cafe and started talking and decided what program we would do together. First, we just met to see if we liked each other. So we had a coffee. And we hit it off right away, so yes. And we did several tours. A great bulk of the, of the work was uh, Schubert. 
Your arrangements of, of Schubert. And I did my own arrangements. He has a specific keys that they, he wanted to do, and I did my own, my own arrangement of it of, of Schubert, and uh, so that I could understand that I had a, a book of the poetry. So I was working on it. And I remember I finished, there was like 10 songs by Schubert. And I was traveling and I had a briefcase that I had my arrangements all written out by hand, a book of poetry. And at that time, I was, I had a pipe, yes, with some pipe tobacco and a pen. And I, when I finished, I was it, it, near Texas, and I thought, oh, I'm going to go and see, visit my sister-in-law. And uh, so I go to, to see her, and I was working on it. And then when I left, getting ready to go to, to Europe to rehearse with Thomas, I go to the ticket counter, put my briefcase down, my guitar, get my boarding pass, take my boarding pass in my hand, go to pick up my briefcase, and it was gone. <laughs> the only, I had, you know, it was so much work. Yeah. And I had to, like, four days in which to redo it all. and. Uh, it never showed up. I even had an announcement on CNN that if somebody could find it, just return it, I would ask no question, please, that this was meaningless for anybody uh, who still briefcases at an airport. <laughs> My only consolation was the disappointment of whoever took it Mm. <laughs> when he opened the briefcase and finds himself a book of German poetry <laughs> and Schubert arrangement. <laughs> oh man, no, that story is hilarious. I do. Uh, everybody's got to hear that story. But I did. So I cool. did get back, and my daughter Angelina, who's a wonderful pianist, helped me to restore a lot of and got it done in time, and we did some gorgeous tours together. Speaking of tours, um, wasn't it um, the Guitar Summit tour? Where yes. Where you did the big tour with um, the three famous I, musicians? That was the, the, yeah, the first Guitar Summit in 1994. Mm. 1994, and it was the last tour of the great legendary jazz guitarist Joe Pass, right. Paco Peña and Flamenco, Leo Kotke, American style playing, and myself, classical. Did you ever do any arrangements for that with them? It, that was all improvised. Mm, okay. I suspected as much as you know, yeah. had Joe Pass around. Yeah, that was that was <laughs> improvised. Well, so when you. Uh, do sit down and do your arranging. Like, what what's your process like? I mean, and I, I'm sure it may vary from piece to piece. But do you prefer to write things by hand? Do you oh, 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 do any software? No, I don't have any. I, I don't know how to do software. Mm. It's a pencil and a piece of paper, <laughs> and of course an eraser. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but but the arrangement is pretty much done in my head. First, and then I then I put it down because when I do it in my head, I'm actually free of the technique, and I I'm free of any. Uh, it's easier for me to to think of something, and then figure out how to play it, hmm. and not be. Ball, uh, mm, tight to making it guitaristically, technically. I like to make it guitaristically sound, <laughs> but not necessarily 
very much like what you did, because you did some incredible challenges in the planets, technical challenges. Yeah, sometimes, you know, some of the certain notes, it doesn't yeah. work, it's better to do some kind of guitaristic to, effect. Yeah, to do something else, exactly. Man. Well, so who does your uh, engraving then? Somebody's got to be doing all that. I am doing a lot of work recently because I have, this is only what got on recordings, right. but I have boxes and boxes <laughs> of handwritten <laughs> stuff. And I'm doing it with, uh, with Brian. Wow. That's awesome. He's awesome. And he and I are having an incredible amount of fun doing it. Mm. And he's great at it. Yeah, he helped me uh, do some of the research for yeah, this interview. Because I, because I know uh, when you're going back to something that you did so many years ago, and then you start rethinking it, and so he's not only helping to put it down, but collaborating with me and as a partner to, to look, to, to revise it. Mm. Well, that's awesome that you have, you know, some, I mean, you have so much work and, uh, you know, what uh, uh, William Krauss and Leilani and all of them are doing with like the Romero Archive yeah. and Brian, it's, it's, uh, they're doing a really good thing by preserving all this stuff. It's so important Th that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm very, very happy and very touched that they're doing that work. Can I ask, um. Uh, I heard in a lecture here at the Institute that in the Romero Institute uh, or the Romero collection or archive, I should say, there is a sword. Do you know what the, the sword is for or what that's from? Or? You need to ask <laughs> Leilani. <laughs> I don't know what the sword was from. Yeah, you're <laughs> you guys didn't, uh, you know, duke it out after rehearsals after no. a you know, no. tough rehearsal <laughs> well we used to do a lot of touring uh, in the early 60s by car hmm. it may have been a defense thing that we got rid in the car uh. <laughs> I don't know yeah. <laughs> self defense it could have been a sword given to my father when he was knighted. That, did they, they, did they let you keep the sword? They used to. Really? They, they didn't, when they knighted me, they didn't give me ah. the sword. They put the sword on my, but they didn't give me the sword. But I think they gave my father the sword. Mm. Man. When were you knighted? What? In 2002, I think. Was it you just was it just you or no, was it No, my three bro my two brothers and I. Oh. That's amazing. We were knighted on the same day. Wow. I was And you know what that means? Well. If the king of Spain is in trouble, I have to get on horseback <laughs> and I have to go save him. They blow a horn. Yes. And you, and I <laughs> jump in the horse and go. <laughs> it's too bad we're not doing a, a comedy interview right now. <laughs> Speaking of uh, comedy, do you have any, any hobbies? My, my favorite hobby, you're going to laugh, is playing the guitar. Mm. But I do have a hobby. I like to paint. Really? Yes. I mm. love to paint. And I used to paint a lot. And uh, then when my three eldest grandchildren, I stopped painting when my career got incredibly busy because I was doing a lot of concerts. I was doing tours with this person, with that, that, that quartet, that orchestra, solo recital. I didn't have time to paint. But then when my grandchildren were born and sometime I would bring them and I think, what are we going to do now? Oh, I'm going to teach you how to paint. And I started giving them lessons how to paint and we bought canvases and paint and that got me started again. That's cool. Do you and still that, have uh, any of your paintings? Oh yes, I have lots of my paintings. Oh, you're going to have to show me some pictures. I, not, I thought you were going to say um, uh, poetry. Poetry, yes. <laughs> poetry is my hobby, but I'm not a poet. Oh. 
But my father was a great poet. Mm. And but painting, I I have done a lot. And then of course reading, listening to music. I love listening to to all kinds of music, art songs, opera, symphonies, string quartets, so other people playing all other instruments, guitar included, and walking on the beach <laughs> and playing chess. Play? You like chess, really? I love chess. I brought the wrong game, so I brought a Go board to the Institute. I should have brought a chess board. Do you play? I play Go, but I, I play very little chess. Yeah. But I, I we could we could get a game going. We could get Good. a game going. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Gwyneth is still uh holding out on me for a go game right now. <laughs> but um I was going to ask um I'm working on being able to beat Brian. I haven't, <laughs> been, I haven't been able to really? do that. Really? Is he good? I don't know how good he is, but he's better than I am. See, I like Go because you can you have handicaps. Yeah. I feel like when I play chess, it's not as easy to make a, like a handicap no, in chess. No, you cannot. No, do you ever start with Brian? But like, you know, you have like one less rook. No. No. <laughs> no. The day will come. <laughs> Amazing. Well, I think I think this is a good stuff. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Pepe, You're very for, welcome. Uh, taking the time out to my, talk to me and everything my pleasure amazing. my pleasure you know, it's dinner time <laughs> thanks for sticking around to the end this episode was made possible thanks to matt denman and brian hayes of the celedonio romero guitar institute the celedonio romero guitar institute is an annual festival where guitar lovers from all over the world come to study with the royal family of guitar los romeros if you are interested in auditioning for the Institute, click the link in the description or visit www.romero-institute.com.